you can see the words on the screen as well. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak round you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guards, they came to the iron gates leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the, at the, of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now, when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. <coughs> and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. <coughs> and the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplies. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they, when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. This is the word of the Lord. And please do keep open that passage. That's where we're going to be counting out, uh, camping out this evening. We're going to be dwelling in this passage. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. Um, but we're going to pray for God's help before we open it up together. So please do join with me as we do so.
God, our Father, we thank you for your words, and we pray this evening that your spirit who inspired it would illuminate it for us, open it up so that our eyes might see, our ears might hear, soften our hearts so that we might accept and obey it. We pray, Lord, that we might know who you are, your plans for this world, and who we are called to be as your people. Heavenly Father, we ask, help us now this evening together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so please do keep open that passage in front of you. But uh, I wanted to begin with just thinking about there's a common trope that we see in movies or TVs or TV shows where people meet their match. You might see it in that high-flying lawyer who uh, defeats all her opponents. She walks into the courtroom very confident, meets someone who looks like they're nowhere near her level and suddenly within 10 minutes realize, realizes she is going to lose her case in this moment because she's met her match. Or you might think of the rugby team from the big city going to play against the small local school. Within the first 10 minutes, they've conceded two tries and they think they've met their match. What we're looking at in today's passage is not like that. Uh, this story that we're looking at here, where we see Herod, we've got two stories in this chapter. Herod is the one that's joined in both. And what we see here is someone who meets the matchless one. You see, a common mistake that we, we make sometimes when we approach a Christian faith, whether you're a believer or not, is we misunderestimate who God is. So often we can come to the faith and we can forget that God is not like us. God isn't a souped up version of the best of us. God is not like the strength of 10 men. No, God is greater and beyond who we are. God is different. He is creator and we are the creation. The danger we can make is when we blur the distinction between humanity and God. God is beyond anything that we can imagine. Uh, one of the old catechisms of the church puts it this way, and I think it's helpful. God is a spirit in and of himself, infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection, all sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, Everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. God is unlike us. We are invited, no, we are summoned to come before God and stand before him in awe. But what we're going to see in this passage today, what we're going to see in this story, instead of standing before God in awe, here we see someone who stands in the way of God and someone who seeks to stand in his place. And we've got two big points that we're looking at this evening shaped around those two stories. You can see it on the service sheet that came in your Bible as you came in. And they're based around that. And the first point that we see here in this first story is that God's purposes, God's purpose will not be hindered. God's purpose will not be hindered. Uh, and we see it here in this story about Peter, where first you see here the, the futility of pushing against God is exposed. So we begin here in chapter 12, verse 1, and Herod is laying violent hands on, on the church, and he kills James, one of the key disciples in this early movement of Jesus' followers. James is killed because Herod wants to harm the church. But the story that we focus in on here is the story of 
Peter. And the reason that Herod wants to go after Peter is because he sees that there is political capital he can win through persecuting these followers of Jesus. Peter is arrested here because Herod sees political gains in it. You see that there in verse 3. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Here, Herod is trying to strengthen his grip on the place in which he rules. And he does this by trying to whip up the favor of his people. Political actions don't really change over time, do they? It can be so dispiriting, isn't it? So disheartening when the concerns of another dictate your circumstances. Herod here is acting out of personal ambition and protection, trying to keep the Jews on side. And he knows he can do this by arresting Peter and having him put to death like James. Um, it's been obviously all the news this week has been about the story of Russia invading the Ukraine. Uh, about seven years ago, there was a new law put in place in Russia which outlawed proselytizing by non-traditional religions. You see, one of the ways that uh, Putin has built up power and influence in that nation is by tapping into probably this mythical vision of what Russia is. And a key part of that is the Russian Orthodox Church. And so this law that he has brought in to win them about says that anyone who proselytizes, anyone who shares the good news about Jesus Christ, who does not belong to that church, can be imprisoned, can be put away for a number of years. There, Putin is trying to win the favor of the people by putting a clamp on gospel proclamation. The ways the world works against the word is repeated century after century, generation after generation. That's what's going on here. And Herod, when he locks up Peter, wants to show his great might. And have a look there, verse 4. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. So four squads of soldiers would be, that's four people in each squad, that's 16 different people to guard this man who's proclaiming the news about the Prince of Peace. We see later that Peter is locked up in chains next to two, two sentries, that at each of the doors outside, they're guarded by another person, that there is a large iron gate blocking him in. Here, Peter is trying to show his power and control. Peter, Herod, is trying to show his power and control over this situation. But trying to stop God's purposes, trying to stop the words being heard, is like trying to stop an avalanche with masking tape. Here we see that even though he does all he can to block him in, that God frees his person to carry out his purposes. We've been talking as we've been working through this book of Acts, that God's great purpose is to see the word spread forth to the ends of the earth. The good news about Jesus Christ dying for our sins and being risen from the grave. The good news to make its way across the world. And God frees Peter so that he can fulfill his purposes. And we see that there, don't we, in verse 8. We see an angel of the Lord comes next to him. And the angel said to him, uh, sorry, verse 7, angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter in the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Here, the angel of the Lord frees Peter even to his own disbelief. We see the story of how he is led out. His hands are free. He's led out through the gates and he's led out to a street far, a few streets away from this prison. But even then he doesn't believe entirely what has happened to him until finally he awakes and the angel is gone. And you see there in verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me 
from the hand of Herod. Here, verse 11 is the reversal of what we've seen in verses 1 to 4. Herod was against Peter. The Jewish people were against the followers of Jesus. But here there's a turnaround. No longer is he held back by them. No longer what the Jewish people were expecting was going to happen. We see this reversal. You see it in the way subtly, uh, the way that the hands work. Have a look at 12 verse 1. That time King Herod, Herod the king laid violent hands on them. Verse 7, Peter's hand, the chains are fell off his hands. Verse 11, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. And here's the reminder that whoever God has set his hand upon, whatever his purpose he has set his hand with, no hands of any human will ever stop that. So I think it's not a case here that God foils the plans of Herod. But it might be more accurate to say that any plans that are made against God's will will be foiled immediately. And so here we see that the, there's a futility against pushing against God. But then what we see in this next part of the passage is how the feeble prayers of God's people are answered. Have a look with me back at verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made by God, uh, made to God by the church. And then have a look with me at verse 12. When Peter realizes this, he goes to the house where he knows they're all meeting. And here we see many were gathered together and were praying. Here the people were in deep prayer because of the situation that Peter was in. And this passage is just filled with humor. I don't know if you noticed that as we were working our way through this. Look first what happens. Rhoda, when she hears Peter, instead of opening the door to him, she runs and goes to tell people what has happened instead. And it's amplified. When she tells them, they say, it cannot be him. You're crazy. Remember, this is the people who are praying for Peter to be liberated. And when their prayers are answered, they don't believe it. She goes on and they say, it must be his angel. But finally here, they see and they open the door and Peter is standing there before them. Remember again, when this was taking place, we are told this happens during the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It happened at Passover. Passover was a key time for the people of God. They remember when they were released from slavery. They remember when they were saved from a tyrant who sought to crush them. And here at Passover, hearing the story that God again has liberated one of them, they don't believe it. It would like being surprised if you asked Elon Musk to buy you a chocolate bar. And when he did, you were surprised that he was able to afford it. It would be silly, wouldn't it? A man with that great wealth is surely able to buy you a chocolate bar, however more expensive they've become nowadays. Here, the people have been praying to God. And God hears their prayers. God answers the prayers of his people. This humor here in this story is meant to unveil. It's meant to expose their foibles and the feebleness of their belief. Not to make them feel bad, but to remind us of the power of the God who hears us, who delights in hearing his people praying for them. It's so often, isn't it, that we can pray, yet not entirely believe that God will work. So often we say prayers for things, but we forget that we've actually prayed for them. I don't know about you, I, I was... Uh, challenged on this might not be the best word, but when seeing other people who used to write down everything that they prayed for so that they might be able to see how God had answered their prayers. 
Now, what's important to remember as we, as we look through this passage here, God always hears our prayers, but he might not answer them in the way that we desire. Remember how this passage begins where we see the death of James. But the point here is not that God doesn't always answer in the way that we want, but here's the encouragement to remember that God still does answer. And he sometimes does answer in the affirmative here where we see with Peter as it lines up with his will for for this world that he liberates his people. Here we see there is power in prayer. Here we see there is great power as God's people gather together to lift up the needs of the church and of the world to him. I've been so encouraged coming back to St. Andrews and hearing of groups who have been gathering, who've off their own back, to pray for the work of God here in St. Andrews and across Scotland. Those people who do it in quiet, they don't tell many people, but they gather together week by week faithfully to do it. But I think sometimes, and what this attitude it challenges here is that attitude where we say, praying isn't that important. We say regularly here, Paul shifted away from the usual pitch for the prayer meeting tonight, where we say that the prayer meeting is the most important meeting of the church every other month. Yet so often I hear from people who say that they take that evening off. Instead of coming to life, where they come to life groups normally, that's the evening that they'll take off. But look at this story and remember that God hears the prayers of his people. And here's the big point. It's not about our prayers, but it's the one who we pray to. It's the God who hears us. You see, that's the big point that we're seeing here, is that neither political machinations or the unbelieving prayers of God's people will hinder God's purposes. God is making himself known, and he is calling us to join in that and to pray for that work. And so God's purposes will not be hindered. And what we see from this second story in this passage is that God's glory will not be hijacked. I've been trying to think about it this week, and I haven't been able to think of a greater social faux pas than this. Come up to me afterwards if you think you know of one, but there's probably no greater social faux pas, is there, than going to someone else's wedding wearing a white wedding dress. Now, I thought there was probably nothing worse than that, but last year I read a story in one of the papers, the story of a mother-in-law who wore a white wedding dress to her son's wedding. I cannot think of anything worse than that. But why is that so bad? Because what she's doing is she's stealing the limelight. This is meant to be a day which is to focus on the new husband and wife joining together. But in that moment, she wants to take the acclaim. She wants people to look at her instead. She's trying to steal the limelight and the glory. The story we see here in the second half at the end of this chapter is a story of a man who tries to steal the limelight, who tries to steal the glory of God. Um, We come to this bit, it's verse 20, now Herod was angry. We come to the story where he's dealing with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Just before this, Herod does not learn his lesson. Herod does not see what has happened when Peter was released. You see, Herod, instead of seeing that he was going against God's plans at this moment, he instead puts the blame on his centuries and he puts them all to death. And then we come to the story of the people of Tyre and Sidon. 
Here, these people, they're dependent upon Herod for food. And again, we see more political game, games. Um, have a look with me on uh, verse 21. Uh, they've managed to work their way, wrangle their way, find one of the important people within Herod's administration. They've gained an audience. And on that appointed day, Herod put on his royal thro- robes, took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Here, they know that the way to Herod's heart, the way to get their way, was to flatter him. Uh, There's a line that stuck with me from a talk I heard years ago. I, I can't remember what the context was, but this line stuck in my head. It's this. You should be more wary of the flatterer than the bully. You should be more wary of the flatterer than the bully. The idea is, is that the bully is obvious and you know what they're trying to do against you. But the one who flatters you, deceives you and leads you down the wrong line. We, we must be careful not to be lulled in by sweet nothings that are whispered in our ears. You see, What the people of Tyre and Sidon have learned is they're struggling for food and they're trying to win the approbation of Herod is that they know that he's got an itch in his ear and they found a way of scratching it by flattering him, by sweetening him up. And Herod succumbs to their words. As you see there, verse 23 Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Remember, this is Herod who has seen Peter escape in the most miraculous way. Herod, knowing that Jesus, that Peter was a follower of Jesus, Yet at this moment, that has not made any impact on the way that he sees and views the world. He has not seen that God is for these followers of Jesus. And so here, his warning has been given to him. Yet he has not heeded it. And so here, instead of giving the glory to God, he takes it for himself. Remember how we said at the beginning how there is this fundamental, unalterable difference between God and humanity. That God is entirely different to who we are. And so glory belongs to him alone. In one of the Old Testament prophets, God says this. He says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. God is God. God is the true God, the living God, the only God. And to him alone belongs worship, praise, adoration, and glory from the world. Yet here, Herod, taken in by the flattering words of the world, has succumbed to it and tried to take the glory for his own. And he is judged in that moment. He is condemned And he is put to death for it. And I think, and it's important at this moment, this is a reminder to us to humble yourself before God. There is a paradox right at the heart of the message of the Christian faith. That exaltation comes through humiliation. We see this in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus, who was rich beyond all imaginings, Jesus, who was God himself, humbled himself to become a servant. Jesus, who humbled himself to the point of death, even on a cross, 
the cross, which was meant to be an instrument of torture and humiliation. Jesus, who took that path, who died for the sins of all who believe in him, Jesus took that path and he is exalted to the right hand of the Father. You see, this is the pattern that we are called to, to follow him in this way. All those who exalt themselves will be brought low, but all those who follow in the way of Jesus, who humbly receive him, will be lifted up with him. And here is the message, humble yourself. This is the reminder to those who get caught up seeking the glory of this world, who seek the praise of creatures rather than seeking to do the will and worship the creator. Humble yourself. But the bigger and the larger message of this is that God's purposes, God's ways will not be stopped by those who try to steal his glory, who try to stand in his place. Have a look there at verse 24. Here, Herod is cut down because of his hubris, because of his pride. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Nothing will stop the advance of the gospel. Uh, The section that we've been looking at over the last few weeks in Acts details how the good news about Jesus, how the kingdom of God is growing, mushrooming out. And this is the reminder at the end of this section that because God is at this, because God is with this, because God is for us, because this is God's plan, it will not be stopped. No matter the seeming power of those who are against it, no matter their pretensions, God's word will go forth. God's word will increase and multiply. God's word will be heard. You see, God's word increasing and multiplying doesn't just mean that God's word is heard. It's not like flyers being pushed through different houses for politicians saying that that means everyone has heard about it. No, the picture here is of people receiving the word and seeing their lives transformed by the grace of God in Christ as people encounter Jesus through the word. The picture here is of the Spirit breaking through the hardness of hearts so that we might come to know Jesus, humbled and lifted up with him. It's an invitation and a reminder to all, if you're here and this is, you wouldn't yet say you're a believer, here's the reminder The word is going forth and here is the opportunity for you to hear it and to respond to it, to humble yourself before it. And it's the reminder to us, this is God's plan. This is God's purpose. This is what he cares about, is seeing his word go forth inviting us to join in with that work and to pray for that work and to see him glorified as people accept Jesus as the king. You see, God's purposes will not be hindered by the world. God's glory will not be hijacked by the world, but God's word will be heard and received throughout the world as his kingdom grows as his spirit advances, as people proclaim and pray for his work. So let's join with him in that and let's pray together for that work. God, our Father, we bow down before you we bend our knee and we proclaim that Jesus is King. 
that he rules and reigns of all authority. We pray, Lord, would you humble us and help us to see the way you are at work. Use us, Lord, even our feeble prayers, even our feeble words. Use us in your work. And we pray through us that you would be glorified, even though we feel weak, even though we feel small, even though we feel insignificant. May your name be lifted high. May you be exalted among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing our final song.